my name is Tim West. Um, I wanted to really say a, a deep thank you to Paula and her entire team that has uh, helped us see Mexico over the last couple of days, and, uh, and to Goose and his team for helping me really understand deeper Mexican culture. Uh, but uh, before I begin, I just want to recognize that a week ago, Mexico City was in a very different place. And, um, you know, coming down here and seeing and hearing some of the stories and the people uh, has really made me realize how these kind of events can really bring people together. Um, so I'm, I'm really, truly honored to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, as we begin to talk about the digital world, uh, the digital world is only as grounded as we are. So I'd like to invite everybody to join me in taking one big collective breath. So if you want to kind of sit up in your seats a little bit and ground your feet, we're just going to take one big breath in and one big breath out. And feel free to make noise. Ready? So this question, what is the future of food? Well, there's a few questions in there. It's my favorite question. What is the future and what is food? And in, before we look at the future, I'd like to take a moment and look towards the past and where we've come from. This is a cover of Atlantic Magazine and it actually references a book uh, in 1491 by uh, Charles Mann. And he talks about the year before Columbus arrived. And uh, before Columbus arrived, he says there's evidence to conclude that there was a diverse polyculture, there's a thriving community and economy in the new world. Uh, and I want to also caveat that a lot of my perspective is very American, um, and, and I recognize that. But, uh, you know, once the, remember when he got there, and when Columbus got to this new world, what did he find? He found this, you know, diverse polyculture, food falling off the trees, and a happy society. And what did they bring? Well, the Spanish brought guns, germs, and steel. They brought disease, right? So as uh, they brought this disease, people got sick, and people died, and then people ran inland to tell and warn people that this disease was coming. And they brought the disease inland. So the way that humans had evolved with the ecosystem to help produce an abundance of food and balance, it fell apart. And uh, then the U.S. took hold, and we fast forward to this other amazing point in history. This is Rosie the Riveter, and uh, during <coughs> World War II, another point where the Americans kind of came together, women entered the workforce. And what happened there? Well, women left their traditional roles in the household, in the kitchen, and they went to work. And, well, they didn't want to go back to the kitchen when the war ended. But what else happened right around World War II? Well, the nitrogen bomb um, gave birth to a tremendous amount of excess nitrogen. But this guy, Norman Warlock, uh, the founder of the Green Revolution, um, he started to apply this nitrogen and phosphorus to potassium to growing food, to large-scale agriculture. So we get this massive abundance of calories. And the prevailing wisdom at the time was that calories save lives. And calories are going to be what saves the world. And you can see with the graph, uh, you know, with calories came population growth. Well, what else happened you know, around the end of World War II? Um, Later in 1969, I believe this was, man landed on the moon. And this other innovation really happened. It was television. A hundred million people around the world were watching television, watching man land on the moon. And what did the food industry do? They promoted Tang. So Tang was uh, the newest innovation. Uh, you don't have to squeeze your orange juice anymore. Uh, you can just drink Tang, just like the astronauts. It also uh, you know, promoted or gave birth to this uh, um, TV dinner and convenience foods, processed foods, Doritos, Campbell's soup, and the Mars bars. And the Mars bar was birthed and created to have enough calories to feed a worker throughout the day. The Industrial Revolution took place, 
people watch television, and this wonderful woman, Julia Childs, uh, started this television show around cooking, and it became very, very, very popular. Um, there's, it's given birth to a rise of a generation of celebrity chefs, Mario Batali, Rachel Ray, Anthony Bourdain, and my personal favorite, when I was in high school, we'd get home from school, my brother, my sister, and I, we'd sit on the couch and watch great chefs of the world, and it would have a great chef from somewhere in the world having a dish and preparing it, and uh, it's, it's kind of the precursor to the Netflix series that's so popular right now, Chef's Table, where now I'm in love with the chef from Pujol. So if anybody can help get me into Pujol, I'd be very, very grateful. But at 18 years old, you know, I grew up um, and uh, I did what I was supposed to do. I went to college at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, and well, maybe I didn't do everything I was supposed to do. I spent a lot of time snowboarding. And uh, I got my first credit card and I uh, had a lot of very poor quality Mexican-American food. And this led to uh, what I would call my first food epiphany. Has anybody here ever had food poisoning before? All right. It's not so much fun. I spent uh, those three days as a freshman in college thinking I was going to die. And I realized something. I realized that I had no idea where my food came from. I had no idea how to cook it. And how on earth am I 18 years old, an American, you know, in a developed country, allowed to grow this old without having any idea where my food came from? So I, uh, I called my twin brother. He was in culinary school at the time. He had decided he was going to learn to cook. I said, how do you cook chicken? And he says, you get a pan hot, you throw some oil in it, some salt and pepper, and you have chicken. So I uh, threw some chicken in a pan, and I sat down to eat it. And there was a knock on the, my door. And it was my friends from down the hall. And they had smelled this chicken cooking, and they wanted me to share. And before I knew it, I'm sitting there, I'm eating chicken with a bunch of friends, and I realized that if I learn to cook, I'm going to be happier, I'm going to be healthier, and I'm going to make more friends all around the world. So that's when I also reflected on, you know, what did my father do? My father was in the uh, water business, and his father, Arch West, is a creator of Doritos. So I thought to myself, if I go into the food business and the water business, I'm never going to be without uh, a job. Food is always going to be necessary around the world. So I decided to join my brother at the Culinary Institute of America um, to learn to cook, and it was there I discovered the slow food movement. How many people know about the slow food movement? About half of you. So this was a radical new concept for me as I was ignorant and entering culinary school. It was the opposite of fast food. It was the opposite of what made me sick. It was about coming together around the table, about respecting your natural resources and cultivating them. So my brother and I got really involved in the slow food movement and uh, started this club at CIA um, called the Chef Sustaining Agriculture Club. And then in 2008, or then after school, I went to go cook at the St. Regis Hotel and so forth. I've got many other stories, but uh, first I want to get to the future of food. So this was the youth food movement. We did a uh, sit-in potluck. It was actually a form of political protest where we did a sit-in and we put this table out for 250 and we came together and we experienced food and community in the slow food way that we really wanted to. And I had somebody come up to me at the end of that and he says, you're going to do great things. You're like, you're, you're going to go places. And I had never heard anybody really tell me that. But at that moment, I began to believe it. And then... I got invited, my brother and I got invited to represent the U.S. at Terra Madre. So this is the world meeting of the food community. It happens every two years. The slow food movement puts on together in Torino, Italy. This was 2008. The theme was youth and music. And um, there was a gentleman at the time. He was keynoting one of the big uh, conferences, um, Will Allen. He's from Chicago. And he had figured out how to bring fresh food into cities. And what he had done is, and he won this MacArthur Genius Award. So he had figured out that if he collects all the compost in the city, uh, all the food scraps, and uses vermiculture, worms, to create compost and fertile soil, he can just cast it in abandoned basketball courts and lots, and there's throw seeds, and food would grow everywhere. And I wanted to talk to him, you know, and I wanted to hear what he had to say, but the timing was wrong, everybody was late, they were on Italian time, and uh, everybody gets rushed to the buses, and he doesn't get to speak, I get to the back of this bus, I get separated from my friends, 
and he's in the bus. And I said, wow, like, Will Allen, you know, what were you going to say? What would you tell a young guy like me? And he says this, he says, if you know what you're doing is right, don't ask permission. Longer stories to that, but um, to get into the meat and potatoes or the fruits and vegetables of what I want to talk about is really about what I learned and inspired me so at Facebook. I became a chef at Facebook after going to the University of Massachusetts and you know, really trying to revitalize the land-grant universities in the States. And I learned at Facebook about hackathons. This was me cooking for hackathons. Actually, this is Katy Perry eating my nachos. I think she liked it. And uh, so anybody, anybody here heard of a hackathon or know what a hackathon is? A couple. So for, let's first get something out of the way. Hacking is not breaking into somebody's email. Hacking is a term that originated in World War II. And it's when the pilots would fly back the planes and kind of crash land the broken ones up. And the engineers would take hacksaws and take this broken plane apart and put it back together in a way that made it more efficient. So hacking actually really means taking something apart, putting it back together in a way that's more efficient. And it was the computer scientists at MIT uh, in uh, Boston that kind of took this concept and tried to apply it to our, uh, our societies. So at Facebook, we were using these hackathons to try and birth new products. But I got invited to, um, start in, you know, to go to my first hackathon. And it was on a bus for, ten, for three days. I knew nothing about coding. I knew nothing about designing. Uh, but I had this idea with some friends that we were going to do a custom cereal company. And the guys, when we got on the bus, they told us, this is going to change your life. You're going to make friends. And you're going like, to believe that you can do anything. And all of a sudden, you know, three days later, we're on 30 different news media outlets all around the world for this silly idea to, you know, enter the mass customized food market through cereal. And uh, I took this idea of hackathons, and I said, what if we weren't just going to build products, you know, to get people to click on ads, but what if we were going to reinvent the food system? So this is me at the first food hackathon. I dressed up as a carrot, inspired by uh, the French poet Paul Cezanne, he says, one day, a single carrot, freshly observed, will start a revolution. I thought it was appropriate. Uh, to date, five years later, we've done, uh, uh, actually birthed out of the second food hackathon was the Future Food Institute. So together, we've done about 10 hackathons. Uh, we've birthed the food innovation program. So we have a master's in food innovation out of uh, Reggio Emilia, Italy. And uh, we've got about 20 fellows in 15 countries with four, on four continents, nine universities, engaged about 30,000 people in this question is, what is the future of food? So it depends how far you want to go into the future. But another question to ask is, who is the future of food? So how many of you take photos of your food? Right, probably quite a few of you. Why do you do it? It's a good question, right? So Eve Turo, she wrote this book, Taste of Generation Yum, how the millennial generation's love for organic fare, celebrity chefs, and microbrews will make or break the future of food. And she talks about, here you know, in this digital world, we're overwhelmed. There's so much stimulation all the time. Uh, and we have no control. But one of the things that we can control is what we put in our bodies. And, or, what people think we put in our bodies. So her theory is, why has people done this? And it's or because they want to demonstrate and have control over what they put in their bodies. So getting to the kind of food trends, and some of the things that I think are going to change the world, and already are. How is, who's heard of the maker movement? Anybody? Awesome. So um, who's heard of a recipe? A, re a recipe. Everybody kind of knows what a recipe is. So a recipe. So this is a, a website called Instructables. And Instructables has instructions on everything. And recipes are probably the easiest re uh, known instruction in the world. And uh, this maker movement, so Make Magazine spawned this maker movement. So they have these maker fairs. Now, I'm sure in Mexico you guys have you know, fairs all the time, but here in the States and around the world, people have lost that custom of coming together. So these maker fairs are the places where people can come together and actually share their knowledge about how to make things. Uh, I think there's somewhere around 190 maker fairs around the world. The four largest are in New York and Shenzhen, um, San Francisco, and Rome, with over 100,000, 140,000 people that come to these. And this was uh, a couple of months ago, they did 
uh, Maker Magazine did a whole issue on food. And now with the Future Food Institute, we are curating some of the food pavilions at some of these maker fairs. So getting into this maker movement, what is it? You won't be surprised, but people really love making beer. So some of these technologies that are emerging are coming out of you know, people's love to create products that create products that help them share that with friends and have a good time. Um, one of the other ways that these technologies and this maker movement is being applied is for actually growing food. So growing food not just in farms, in these large-scale farms, but growing food in city centers and growing food in people's homes. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Because food is nutrition, right? Food is medicine. You know, Hippocrates says this. But we don't often really think of it. Sometimes we, or we unconsciously consume those processed food products. So as these devices that enable us, these technologies enable us to grow food easier at home, what's going to begin to happen is it's going to begin to uh, make people think that we can actually have, say, I can grow a tea instead of take a pill, right? And this is going to happen right in your, in your own home. So my handheld device is going to be able to tell me, you know, I'm low in iron today, so I need to have the uh, ginseng tea or whatever it may be. And this is where it gets really, really exciting. So Caitlin talked a little bit about how Amazon has now bought Whole Foods, which is kind of really exciting and uh, kind of scary at the same time because Amazon makes all of their money on web services, on data, just like Google does, right? So how can anybody else really compete with an Amazon of the world that doesn't need to make any money on Whole Foods? They just want to collect the data. They want to acquire the users that have the disposable income um, so that they can collect the data and sell it to the big companies. Another kind of online platform that is paving the way for this personalized nutrition space, which is paving the way um, for this kind of disruption, is Thrive Market. But one even cooler is this one called Good Eggs. It's kind of hyper-local, mostly to San Francisco. They started art as like an online farmer's market. And just to say one thing about farmer's markets, you know, I know you guys have them here, in the States, they've exploded all across the United States. People are buying direct from their farmers. The farmers are getting more money. People are getting fresher, better, healthier food that's no, more nutritious. What's not happening at farmer's markets? Well, people are paying in cash. Farmers are not pr actually probably reporting all of the cash they're making to the government. So taxes aren't being paid. So what's, happening, what's not happening is the reporting. I believe there's actually an incredible growth in fresh and food consumption, specifically fruits and vegetables, that is not being seen right now. So these guys, Good Eggs, you know, they've got kind of things you'd find at a farmer's market. But on this side over here, this is a map of the San Francisco Bay Area. It's very similar to kind of what you would see in Italy in the slow food movement. And these are all micro producers that are all around that now, thanks to this platform, have access to this marketplace. And they have a way to differentiate themselves to the market and to actually bring better quality nutrition. So this is really going to be what disrupts the big brands. But some of the big brands, the smart ones, are realizing they're either going to get disrupted or killed, or they're going to innovate together. So GE created this makerspace. Uh, I believe it's somewhere in Tennessee. People can come in. They can create their own microbrew uh, you know, devices. They can create their own grow-at-home devices, whatever it may be. But it gives GE access into that innovation that's happening so that they can become a part of the community. And as some of these you know, new technologies and devices develop, they can actually help kind of grow them into their platform. One other kind of exciting thing I discovered a few years ago when I was invited to speak at Singularity University alongside this guy, uh, Harold Schmitz. He's a chief science officer of Mars. Now, Mars bars, Skittles, M&Ms, like, you know, I thought these guys, you know, they don't know anything about nutrition. Let me tell you, they do, because they had launched this Innovation Institute for Food and Health at UC Davis. And they focus on five global grand challenges. And it pertains to their core business, but it's good for the planet at large. So sustainable cacao, sustainable pr protein, food safety, affordable nutrition for all, and my favorite, uh, the rise of the internet and how that's shifting consumer behavior. So they've opened this platform up, and they've done so inside the University of California system, one of the greatest university systems in the world. 
so that they can tap into all of the innovation that's happening in that network, into the hackathons and so forth, and actually grow with the industry. And part of my job working with these guys is to help recruit any other industries that want to be along these lines for these global grand challenges. One of which, which Dakai is going to talk a little bit more about later, is around climate change. So climate change is the greatest you know, threat to everybody on this planet. But it is also the greatest unifier of our time. So Mars has pledged a billion dollars to invest in technologies that help reduce their own carbon emissions. And they're also inviting other companies to do the same. So what they're doing and what they're demonstrating is another trend that I'm really seeing that I want to see more companies do is what I call true cost accounting. So it's accounting for all of the impact on the environment for these kind of companies. So we can see and feel that the future of food and the future in general is tremendously fast. Obama recently was uh, in Wired magazine um, and he says, I believe we can work together to do big things that raise the f fortunes of people here at home and all around the world. I still believe science and technology is the warp drive that accelerates the kind of change for everybody. So a better question than what is the future of food might be, what do we want the future of food to be? Do we want it to be that kind of pre-Columbus abundance and healthy society, or do we want it to be that you know, large-scale agribusiness? I was in uh, Goose's office the, uh, yesterday, and I saw this banner on the wall, and it says, the future is whatever. And really, like, the future is whatever we want. I, I was walking down uh, the avenue here, and I saw this green wall. I was like, I want that future. I want all of these uh, spaces, the concrete, the rooftops, to be growing food, right? This is the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, where uh, Dakai um, uh, teaches AI. And um, Asia, uh, in this region, has kind of an advantage because they're building cities from scratch. So they can do so kind of with intelligent design, having learned mistakes in the past. Uh, Mexico City has been around forever. So to be able to transition this city to a place that produces food, it's much more difficult, but it's possible. These are some renditions from an artist in India of what some of these cities could look like. We could actually be growing our nutrition here at home and we can be leveraging these di digital technologies and platforms for creating small brands, for distributing that wealth where it wasn't before because it was locked up in the distribution channels and the media. And then we can begin to do what I think is most important, which is really about teaching our kids. So this is a school in the Bronx, New York, just uh, south of where I grew up, a uh, really rough neighborhood when I was growing up. So this is the Green Machine, and it was in that uh, Make magazine I saw. And these kids are learning to grow food in schools with these machines. And the amazing thing that's happening, and don't quote me on the exact statistics here, but it was roughly around, f they had a 50% uh, drop in absentees. So students were coming to class more. But even more incredible was they had about a 40% rise in test scores. So when it comes down to it, I really believe, you know, children are the future, and we really, if we feed them well and let them lead the way, we're going to really begin to come back to a place uh, where we can challenge the status quo by creating innovative disruptions, but we can come back to that place of abundance, right? And everything kind of comes in cycles. So uh, a cycle is kind of like a zero, and there's one cycle, so ones and zeros, digital, I think we're going to come back around. And that's what I think the future of food will be. Thank you. Thank you.